The setting is ancient Egypt. You are one of many architects called forth to help Cleopatra build a fabulous, <coughs> fabulous new palace to please her. One of you will be named the chief architect, and those of you that fall victim to corruption will be fed to the gators. Who will win and who will die? Find out this week on Board Games with Scott. Welcome to Board Games with Scott. This is a video series where I take a board game and uh, explain how to play it and lightly review it. This week I'm going to be talking about Cleopatra and the Society of Architects. This is the newest release by Days of Wonder and is for three to five players. It takes about an hour and it's a light strategy game. Um, this game is about working for Cleopatra. Everyone's playing a builder, an architect and you're going out and you're building things for Cleopatra, you're hiring artisans, you're collecting raw materials, you're putting them together, you're building it to try to make Cleopatra happy. And as you build things, you're going to get talents or points, or, and those are going to accumulate, and at the end of the game, the person who gets the most points wins. Except, this game has a catch. Throughout the game, there will be a number of things you can do that will make you more powerful in the game. You could, you could bring in one artisan, or you could go out and get two artisans, but become a little corrupt in doing it. You can do things a little under, underhandedly. You can work with oh, envoys and courtesans. And working with these people all gets you a little bit more corrupt. And these corruption will be represented by these small corruption markers. And as the game goes on, everyone's going to put corruption markers in a little pyramid that they have through this little piggy bank slot. At the end of the game, you're going to look, and the person who has the most corruption dies, is fed to the gators. Cleopatra tosses you to her crocodiles, so the person who gets the most corruption throughout the game cannot win the game. So you have to be very careful. You want to see who's getting lots of corruption and try and be second most, because more corruption is going to make you more powerful in the game, but if you get too much, Cleopatra's not happy, and it's croc food for you, baby. Also, if there's a tie, everyone who's a tied dies. So what happened during one game that I played is at the end of the game, two people had five corruption and two people had six corruption. It was that close. Two people knocked out of the game and the other two counted their points to see who won. So you want to watch the corruption. So let's see what's inside. Well, the first thing that's inside is actually on the outside. The bottom of the box is actually part of the game. You use this as part of what you're building on. And on top of that goes one of the two boards. And in front of that goes another one of the boards, like this. And you're going to play the game like that. So those boards are nice. The game comes with little cardboard pyramids for each player that fold up with little slots for putting corruption markers. You get some corruption markers and some talents, chits that are used for keeping track. You have some wooden dice. Each player has uh, a couple little plastic Anubi figures, and there's a plastic Cleopatra figure. Um, there's some good sized playing cards, which typical cards, but then the cool stuff. The game comes with this nice heavy duty board, and this is the quarry. This is where you're going to go and get these neat pieces. And these are these big plastic pieces that you put on the board as you build them. So you've got uh, some sphinxes, you've got obelisks, you've got walls, you've got these tiles, you've got a throne and a pedestal. You've got a lot of neat plastic here. Uh, when it's all laid out, it's really eye-catching. You've got this great Egyptian theme and these big pieces, and you might assume you were playing a role-playing game or a miniatures game, but it's not. It's a board game. There's also some nice reference cards for each player that gives you quite a bit of information about the game. It's quite useful. So, the components are fantastic. This game has some of the best components of any board game out there right now. It's the really, really nice-looking components. But... Is it just pretty, or is there anything underneath? I'll talk about that a little bit in gameplay. The way the gameplay works is on your turn, you have two main actions you can take. You can either go to the market and get new cards, or you can go to the quarry and build stuff. So you're either going to be getting cards, or you're going to be building things. Now, the cards, one thing I should say that's interesting, when you set up the game, what you do is you take the deck, you split it in half, 
you flip one half over and you shuffle them together. Now I wonder how this was developed. I wonder if during playtesting someone accidentally screwed up and they just decided to give it a shot. But what happens then is after you've shuffled a couple times, then you have this mixture of some cards that are face up and some cards that are face down. So it's a pretty clever mechanic in order to give you some information, but not all the information. Now, if you decide to go and get cards to go and visit the market, there's going to be three market stalls. And you can pick one of these three rows of cards to take into your hand. And you have to take the whole row of cards into your hand. And then you have to check your hand size. Your hand size is 10. So after you draw cards, let's say you have three extra in your hand, you either pay one corruption, so put a corruption in your pyramid, and discard your hand, your, your, your hand down to 10. Or you may keep cards above 10, but you must have to pay, you must get one corruption for each card you keep above 10. So if you're above 10 cards after you draw, you have to look and you either have to pay one corruption for each card you keep above 10, or you pay one corruption and discard all the way down to 10. 11 is a pretty good card number to have because at 11 cards, you can just pay your one corruption, which you would have had to pay anyway, and keep that 11th card. So that's a little trick. Try to bring your hand to 11. That's a pretty beneficial place to be. Then the next thing you have to do is replenish the market. And the way you do that is you take the top three cards. You look at the first one. This is wooden log. And I now take this and choose which of these three piles it goes into. So I might say, I oh, will put the log there. And then you take the next card and you put it in one of the other two. And then you take the third card and put it in, in the final one. So each market is going to get a card, and the player, after they take a market, determines where the next three cards go. So sometimes there'll be no information about what it is, it's face down, and other times you'll know exactly what it is because it's face up. The cards that you're taking tend to fall into two categories. There are resource cards, which help you to build things, and then there are special cards, which do all sorts of things. The resource cards fall into two types themselves. There are normal resource cards, which give you one good of that resource. Then there are corrupt resource cards, which give you two goods of that resource, but also a corruption. The characters do all sorts of things, and it tells you on the reference card what all the characters do. Usually they're a way to get more cards or break the rules a little bit, but you have to take corruption. Um, some of them let you get cards from other players in exchange for corruption. Uh, the courtesan lets you dig through the discard pile. Um, and the Vizier lets you draw extra cards, and the Smuggler lets you keep more than 10 cards. A strategy note, it's really handy to have the Smuggler in hand, take a market stack that's huge, it takes you way above 10, and then play the Smuggler, pay one, and then the next turn go to the quarry and build a bunch of stuff. So the special cards, they all say on them what they do. Oh, there's like a wild special card that functions similar to the ships that you have. The ships that you have allow you during the game to use one of these in exchange for a good when you need to build something at the quarry, but if you don't spend it, you get three points. There's some cards in the deck that give you a corruption in exchange for uh, some of the different types of building materials. So that's what the cards do. The second thing you can do during your turn is you can go and visit the quarry. If you visit the quarry, then you're going to use the board over here, and they've given you this nice board that organizes all the different pieces you're going to use in the game. And so as you take them off the board, and you'll place them onto the main playing board. So this quarry is a separate board that just sits alongside. I'm first going to show you where everything goes on the board, and then I'm going to talk about how it scores points. So when you visit the quarry, you go, you spend your cards, you spend your merchants, you spend your whatevers um, to build things. And the building cost is on the reference card, and I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, so I'll show you where all the building bits go. Now, they've given you nice places where most of the things go, so the two obelisks go here and here. The sphinxes go behind them, and they go in pairs. The first sphinx goes on the number one, the second sphinx goes on the number two, three, four, five, and six, and that continues on. The door frames go on either side of the main door, like this. The throne and the pedestal go up here in the middle of the top board. The column walls are a little tricky. These are the column walls, and they're going to go around the outside of the top board. 
So they're going to go like this. And they're going to go around the outside, on this side, the back and over. Here and here, the column walls are already built. So don't, you do not put a column wall here. You don't do that. That's already completed. Because on the side of the box, it actually shows you where the column walls still need to be built. So these two are column walls that are already built. Then they go around the outside of the board. So there's space for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine column walls. They don't go on the front. And finally, the mosaics of the gods are these tiles, and they go on top of the board like this. And you can hum along some Tetris music if you'd like when you're trying to play it. So now let me talk a little bit about how these things score for you. Now all this stuff gives you uh, talents, and that's income, and that's going to be the points that you get at the end of the game. You go to the quarry, and when you're at the quarry, you may build as many things as you'd like because you take your whole turn to build. So you don't get to pick any new cards if you build for a turn. So if you go here, then you get to build. Now I'll talk through the points at each earn. The easy ones. First, the two obelisks, they earn 12 points. The throne and the pedestal, they also earn 12 points each. So those are easy. The sphinxes, the first sphinx earns two points. The second one of a pair earns five points. So this one earns two, this one earns five, this one earns two, this one earns five. So you tend to wait until you can build two sphinxes so you can get the benefit of that. The column walls go around the outside, and whenever a column wall built is built, it's worth a base of three talents, and then an additional one for each of these spaces that's already covered up by mosaics of the gods. So in this point, this column wall is worth three, four, five, and six because it's next to three mosaics of the gods. So column walls are going to be worth somewhere between three and six. The door frames have to do with the columns that run around the outside. And so the door frames earn four points as a base plus one additional point for each of the walls that's connected to it. Now you don't count this one, but you do count over here. So in this case, this door frame would be worth four, five, six points. And so you continue going all the way around. If all nine were filled in, then the door frame would be worth four plus nine for 13 points. So you continue until you hit an empty space. So you start from here, you don't count this one, but you count around that way. And every time you hit a column wall, you count an extra one for the door frame. Finally, the mosaics of the gods, they go on top here, and wherever you place them, they're worth a base of four points, four talents, plus an additional point for every one of these palm trees that you cover up. Now, at this point, I should talk about the idea of a sanctuary. Whenever you build these up here, you have the ability to create a sanctuary. A sanctuary is created by making a space that no other piece can fit in. Now, you know that all of these pieces are at least five. And so if you can block off four or three or two or one, then you know that nothing else can fit in there. Another trick you can do is you can try and block off a space that none of the pieces can fit in. On the reference sheet, it shows you what all the various combinations of five tiles are. And so you can be tricky and you can look and see what's remaining and say, well, I know that, for example, there's one piece that's long, that's five spaces long. Well, if it's already been used, then you could block this off like this. And you could say, this piece has already been used, because you might see it somewhere else on the board. This has already been used, so I can claim that as a sanctuary. You claim a sanctuary by putting one of your statues on there. And you only have two of those. But at the end of the game, each space of sanctuary you've claimed removes one corruption that you've gotten. So when you're placing the mosaics, it's a little tricky. Now here's one of the problems. With the mosaics, you have to play the one that's on top of the pile. At the beginning of the game, you just mix them up randomly. And you can only play the one that's on top. There is a card in the deck that will let you actually dig into that pile and pull out the one that you're wanting. Uh, that's called the scribe. Also, after you play your mosaic, you look at the next one that's on top and you see, is there anywhere on the board it could go? 
If it can't go anywhere on the board, you discard it, and you continue going through the stack that way. So the mosaics are the trickiest part. That's where people tend to spend a lot of time thinking through, you know, what's the best place to put this so that I can chunk off a large area for myself while still placing it on these palm trees to get me points. It's a, it's a tight balance you have to play between solving the puzzle of blocking off space and getting points. So as you can see, many of the scoring elements affect each other, and that comes into play when you're trying to think about what to do. Another thing you need to know is that if you manage to build two things during your turn, you get an additional two talents. If you build three or more things during the turn, you get an additional five talents. Now whenever you successfully build stuff, then you have to roll the dice. There's this little chit here that's going to sit off the board, and after you build stuff, you roll the dice. And every dice that comes up with this onk symbol, onk, onk, there's only one on the die, goes onto this little board. And once all five of these get filled up, so what'll happen is this, it'll stay there, and the next person will go, and after they build, they roll. And, and again, whenever you get onks, they go on the board. When the board, this little board has all five dice as onks, then you have a sacrifice round. You roll the dice for sacrifice, which is kind of fun to chant, by the way. Roll the dice for sacrifice. Try it. So what you do is you then, everyone, when, when this is all full, everyone takes a number of their talents and puts them in their fist and shows them at the same time. And everyone is giving these as a sacrifice. You get rid of them. The person who gets rid of the most gets rid of three corruption. Everyone else has to take corruption. The person who gets rid of the second most has to take one corruption. And the next one has to take two corruption and take three corruption, etc. And so this can be a way you get rid of sacrifice or it can be a way that you lose lots of points and don't get anything for it if someone bids one more than you do. So again, everyone puts it in their hand and shows it at the same time. Highest person gets to lose three of their corruption. Now this is the reference card that everyone gets during the game and this will help you figure out how much things cost to build. This can be overwhelming because when it comes time for you to go to your quarry, you're going to look, you're going to have this handful of cards, you're going to say, oh, there's so many choices, I don't know what to build. Uh, if you look at the card, you'll, you'll begin to think about it, you'll begin to see a few patterns that will help you out. First off, everything costs artisans. So artisans are used for everything. So whenever you're trying to figure out what to get, artisans are always good to get. Now also, everything is going to cost either stone or marble. And sometimes it's going to cost both stone and marble. So stone and marble are the two next most commonly used things. The mosaics of the gods, of which there are 12, require both a stone and a marble. The column walls, of which there are nine, require a stone. The next things are the, the lapis and the wood, and those are used the least frequently. The lapis is used in the mosaic of the gods, of which there's 12, and the wood is used in the column walls, of which there's nine. So artisans in everything, stone or marble or both in everything, and then wood in three of the things, and lapis in three of the things. So during the game, you take turns, you either go and get more cards at the market, or you go to the quarry. Every time you build everything of a particular category, two obelisks, the throne and the pedestal, six sphinxes, etc., or you can't place any more of the remaining mosaics of the gods, Cleopatra moves forward one step on that track. And when she hits five, then that's going to be the end of the game. Um, so not everything's going to get built. The game goes until all the categories of stuff are built except for one, and that one doesn't get completed. So at the end of the game, you then have to take one extra corruption amulet for any of the cards that are tainted, any cards that have corruption. There's a little crocodile in the top corner. You take one extra corruption for each card that you didn't get rid of that was a tainted card. You then look at your sanctuary squares and remove one corruption for every sanctuary square you manage to get during the game. And then at that point, the most corrupt player dies. And then you count up the talents that you have, if you're still living, and the player with the most talents will win the game. Uh, for every one of the wild tokens that you did not use, you get an additional three points. If there's a tie, then the person with the least corruption wins the game. So that's how the game works. <laughs> So what do I think about Cleopatra and the Society of Architects? The more I play this game, the more I like this game. Uh, when I first played the game, I played it with a bunch of new people. There were five of us. None of us really understood what, go what was going on. And we spent a long time staring at this sheet, trying to figure out what it was we could build. The problem with that is that there's nothing to do in this game when it's not your turn. 
So the more time that people spend staring at the sheet, the slower the game goes. The game is designed to be played in 60 minutes, and if it plays in that amount of time, it's fun for that amount of time. I see games have this scale that's sort of, you know, how long they take as compared to how much fun you're getting out of it. And if, the, if this game plays in an hour, it's a very, very fun game. Uh, so the trick with that is that when it's not your turn, please figure out what you're going to do. If you are lollygagging, wandering off in space, and then it comes to you, and then you have to sit down and say, oh, well, what can I build? You'll sit there for a while looking at your different building possibilities. If you're going to the quarry to build, then you know you're not getting new cards. The only thing that could come into play there would be some of those special cards. But if you're not going to the quarry, then you know that um, you could sit there. If you're going to the quarry, you can sit there and plan out what you're doing. So when it comes to you, you can just make your purchases and the next player can go. It, it can go very quickly. So if you aren't planning on building, then you may want to be planning on building. Look to see what do you want to do, what do you need to do that, and then that'll tell you what you should pick when it comes to you and you have your choice of the market stacks. Now it's true, the market stacks change out fairly quickly. So you can't look and plan for people ahead which market stack you want. What you should have in your head is, all right, I want to build a mosaic of the gods. I need a lapis to do that, so I'm going to see what my choices are on the market stacks. Choose your stack, replenish the market, let the next player go while you plan out what to do. This game plays better with fewer players because, again, there's nothing to do when it's not your turn. There's no trading. There's none of that stuff. So when it's not your turn, you have to wait, and hopefully you'll plan. And with a few players, with three players or four players, it goes along pretty quickly. With five players, it can really drag out uh, beyond the point where it's not fun anymore. So how would I rate this game? Well, it's a sliding scale. It's a curve. I, I'll grade this game on a curve based upon, A, the number of players you have, and B, the amount of time people take when they take their turns. If you have people that are planning when it's not their turn and they can take their move fairly quickly, then this game's a good solid A. If you have people that don't plan ahead or take a long time when taking their turns or you play with a bunch of new people, uh, you'll feel this game, I feel this game is more around the B, B minus area because there's really nothing to do when it's your turn. So it's a game that will improve as the players get better at the game. Um, it's a very attractive game. The bits are beautiful. It's a great game to play in a public space to draw people over because you can explain what's going on fairly easily. You know, oh, you go here and you get resources and you go here and you build stuff. The corruption element is fantastic. Uh, we've seen this kind of element in some games before where if you are a certain player, you lose. And so there's this really neat tension of taking more corruption and hoping that you don't have the most corruption because you don't want to die. So, with that cheery note, thank you very much for joining me on this episode of Board Games with Scott. Visit BoardGamesWithScott.com for a lot more. There's some links where you can purchase the game. And, uh, Board Game Geek is a great resource for these things. And the folks at Days of Wonder have a great website where you can go and get a lot of information about their games. Um, if you buy this game as well as any of the other Days of Wonder games, there's a little code on the back. You can use that code to go and play some of their other games like Ticket to Ride online for free. And so it unlocks that. It's like a subscription, but buying this game gives you more time on their online site. Uh, so I guess that's about that. So thank you very much for coming, and I'll see you on a future episode of Board Games with Scott. Farewell. then at that point, the most corrupt player dies. Now, when I played the game, someone always seems to point out on, this, on the sheet here, it does say, the most corrupt player dies. So, you know, it, be careful when you're playing this game, because death isn't too fun. And, you know, um, it doesn't say, you know, the most corrupt architect, the most corrupt character, the most corrupt player dies. So watch it out. <laughs>